even in my developmental stage, I would position things as products, as services, as things you could buy. From Swoop, it's Take the Plunge, a podcast about how business owners decided to stop what they were doing and took the plunge to start their own business. We take a look at how they came to that decision and what those first crucial steps were in getting their business up and running. My name is Kieran, and I'll be your host for this episode. Today, I'm delighted to be joined by Hallie Fawcett, founder of Focus for Business. Following her successful career in marketing and receiving an MBA from Imperial College, Hattie rediscovered her inner entrepreneur and worked in two startups before starting Focus for Business. Having seen investments from both sides of the fence as a founder raising money, but also seeing what investors were looking for, it helped her establish what it was she wanted from Focus for Business and helping to demystify and help business owners deal with that frustration in terms of the process of raising equity finance. So you're very welcome, Hattie. How are you doing today? I'm doing really well, thank you, Kieran, and it's a pleasure to be here. Brilliant. Um, well, if I could take you a moment back in time, uh, I'd love to kind of hear what you were doing before setting up Focus for Business, and then why you decided to take the plunge, so to speak, and set up Focus for Business. Yeah, really good question. And um, I, do you know? I don't think it was one thing specifically. Although that's not totally true, there was a moment in time and I'd been raising investment for the business I was running and had experienced the pain of firsthand of how hard it is to um, mm -hmm. to raise equity investment as a founder and how you don't, it's all a bit smoke and mirrors, you're not quite sure what you need to do when you need to do it. So Focus <laughs> for Business came out of that personal experience of it, finding it difficult and challenging and mystifying to raise investment but if I if I think about it I'd actually been probably been sort of rehearsing to do this all my life if, if that's um, one oh, way yeah? of looking at it yeah I mean I, I looked right if I look right back um, you know I was raising money for businesses local businesses as a kid I used to get school friends together and we back the businesses we wanted to see succeed and run projects along in certain areas and when I was in my teenage years I was trying to start a choir school for girls because they and in those days I'm quite old in those days you didn't have girls in choirs cathedral choirs that sort of thing um, so all, all my life I've been in this entrepreneurial vein um, and then yeah. worked in two startups. So I suppose you could say this has been brewing for some time. <laughs> Destiny. <laughs> Destiny, fate, passion, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> it's been coming for a while. <laughs> and, and after receiving the calling, so to speak, did it, get, did it take you long to get up and operational? So I started quite... Um, softly testing the market seeing if mm. there was interest um, seeing if there was demand and um, it's grown over the last four years I'd say really I think it took me a little while to work out exactly what my customers needed my support with I, I knew broadly uh, the challenge because as I said I'd been through the process of trying to raise equity investment and found it difficult so I knew broadly the challenge but I didn't know exactly how to support my customers initially. So I went through a development process. I tried lots of different things. I tried a bit of this, I tried a bit of that. I tested different approaches. And that was the way in which I defined ultimately the, the main program I run now, which is an eight week funding accelerator. So it's it was a developmental yeah. process rather than ta-da, here it is on day one. <laughs> and I suppose I'm, it was very experimental, but how do you manage that whilst trying to acquire customers or maintain relationship with customers? Were you kind of upfront with customers along the way or kind of how, how did you play that one out? Yeah, so I mean, I'm a marketeer by background. I had 15 years in, in marketing. Um, so I, I knew a little bit already about how to present an offer and how to um, market that and draw people um, towards a, an offer to see if it was appealing. So even in my developmental stage, I would position things as products, as services, as things you could buy. So it wasn't market research in that I was, you know, on the telephone talking to people about it or 
um, doing surveys to find out what people did. I actually developed products, packaged them, put them up on my website, marketed them in social media and did sales calls. That's the key to yeah. generating business is getting on the phone to your customers and finding out what their problems are and then demonstrating how you can solve those problems for them. I suppose having kind of started to roll out that blueprint, who was the, the first customer, so to speak, then that you got over the line? So I work with founders, um, founders of startups. Um, and usually they are businesses that have been running for between six months to two years. So the first, uh, the first cohort that I brought together for the, the precursor of the product I now run, the funding accelerator I ran, now run, there, there were four initially on that very first program I ran. They were all early stage businesses. They all were looking to raise investment and they thought they probably wanted to do it through crowdfunding. And yeah. I brought them together. We in, um, this was pre-COVID, but we did it all over Zoom. So we would meet virtually in a Zoom room and the product developed from there for those first four customers. Over the, after that cohort, I made changes to improve it. Um, and then in the intervening four years, I've actually changed the program fairly significantly. In fact, it's unrecognizable to yeah. that first product um, because as you, as, you, as you develop it with customers, you improve it, you see what needs improvement and you, you make those changes and hopefully it's a better experience all round. I've certainly enjoyed the process of changing it and hopefully the proof is in the pudding. You know, I've raised over a million yeah. in the last 12 months for the customers I've worked with. Awesome. And in terms of kind of th that experience for the customers, do you find in this particular type of raising funding, equity funding, is it best to do it in that peer format where people can share experiences and, and how they're going through it? Or do you prefer to kind of work on a kind of a one-to-one -one basis? I love the peer learning environment because I don't think any one person has all the answers. And so although in all of the mm. programs I run, I have content that I'm presenting, I think the real magic happens when um, you're in a room with others and people start sharing from their experience. So you stimulate the conversation around a particular area. We might look at forecasting, we might look at business valuation, we might look at what investors mean by traction. It doesn't really matter, whatever the topic, you present some information, you get a conversation going around it. And then people share what, from their understanding of what it is, their experience of how that occurs when they're talking to investors. And as I say, that's where the magic happens because the insights that come from hearing what others are doing in this arena really speed up the process of raising investment. So for me, peer learning mm. is absolutely the way to go because you, you, then you get some uh, real content around what it is the, what the thing is you need to focus on, but then you get all this extra colour, if you like, by hearing everyone mm -hmm. else's experience mm -hmm. of that process as well. So it's really powerful. A lot of the businesses I work with ha are recently started, so they're in the very early stages and they're all going through that process of working out what it really is that makes their business tick and what, what makes their customers um, buy. And when you're raising equity investment, you know, which is what I help my customers do, investors really want to understand what is behind your business, what makes it work. And um, investors tend to talk about this thing called traction. Um, and I, I see traction as equation. It's about having a product. Some people call that a minimum viable product, which just means it solves a problem, but it might not be the all singing or dancing version of your ultimate product. So it's the beginnings of something, mm -hmm. but you've got that product. You've got your first happy users. You might be paying customers or, um, or might just be testing something out, trialing it, beta customers, not yet paying you money. And then when you've got those two things, the final piece you really need is that marketing machine, something that allows you to get more customers in a cost-effective way. Um, and that's that's mm. the journey I think all startups go on, all founders go on. You know, what's my product? Where do I find my customers? Who are my customers? What do they look like? Who really engages with me? And then how do I get more of them? So, you know, that's the process I've been on with my business, but it's the process all my clients go through as well. And it's what 
it's the evidence that investors want when they back your business. So kind of we're all really mm. on the same inquiry, the same journey on what matters. And then I suppose just on, on that analogy there, how have you gone through that transition yourself? Obviously, you mentioned first four through the door, yep. got up and running with a, a crowdfunding focus. How did you start to see, obviously, A, there's there's something in this, people want, it, people want this information and I can give it to them. And then B, how did you go from getting those initial customers to being able to get new customers through through the door? Yeah, I mean, that's a really interesting process. And, and it's not one thing, it's an iterative process. You have to try lots of different things. So, you know, from that very first early program that I ran, I, I got the message that I was on the right track because my customers told me, you know, I asked them at the end of the program, yeah how was that give me your feedback and they gave me bless them um, very very positive feedback but really constructive feedback in the things they wanted to see more of as well so that helped me yeah. shape and improve the product it also helped me actually get my next batch of customers because they provided case mm-hmm. studies so i interviewed all of the, yeah. those who'd been through the program and followed their journey watched them as they successfully raised investment and then interviewed them again about that whole process. So they became a case study. And a case study is a great way of getting new customers because you show how the process works. You show how you support your customers from point A to the to point Z, if you like, the bit where they've got mm. what they want. So that, that was another thing I did. The other thing that happy customers provide for you is word of mouth marketing which is the best marketing for two reasons. It's really honest and frank. It's your customers saying why they like what you do. But the other reason it's really great is it's free. It doesn't cost you any money. And in the early days of my business, word of mouth marketing was um, vital to me because I didn't have a huge marketing budget initially. Um, It's still really valuable to me now, but now it works alongside other things that I do as well. So I suppose, yeah, progressing down that funnel, so to speak, then... How do you manage then resourcing? So where you're in a situation where you are now, you've got probably more customers than you ever had at the very beginning. Uh, At what point in time do you start to bring additional resources in, either from a tech point of view or human point of view? How did you go through those kind of decision-making moments? It's uh, an interesting process that as well I think part of it is about pain you keep going as long as you can (laughs) until the pain gets too much and you think I have to fix this (laughs) so uh, you know where do you where do you prioritize where the pain is greatest (laughs) (laughs) so what what was the biggest pain that hit you the most um for me, it was handling uh, the, the two sides of the business. You've got to have um, a, yeah. a strong operation and delivery arm when you're a training business like I am. So you've got to be able to deliver mm-hmm. for your customers. But also you've got to make sure that you've got more customers coming through on a constant basis. So there's two sides yes. to my business, delivery and marketing. Um, and in the early days, that was a real challenge to keep on top of both things at once. So what I initially started to do is look at, well, what could others do as well or better than I can? And I looked to subcontract some of those things. So I worked with freelancers initially on some of the marketing activity that I do, particularly with regards to social media, video, um, case studies, and and even, um, you know, some of the writing that you might need to do, copywriting that you might need to do for a website Mm. or whatever. So I started subcontracting when the pain got too much. Um, But I I never, I didn't in the early days subcontract the delivery because I felt, you know, I needed to um, maintain the quality. And until I had been really clear about where the value was, I didn't want to start involving others until I could sort of make it into a formula that could be repeated by others. So I think you have to work out where your core value is in what you're offering your customers and make sure that that is consistent yeah. and, and and developing it in a way that allows it to be delivered consistently, whether you're doing it or somebody else is doing it. And yeah. then um, yeah. look look to subcontract the things that others can do just as well as you, if not better. In terms of that subcontractor piece, did you find there was a good pool of talent that you naturally went to or did you use sites like Fiverr or 
or freelancer.net where, where were you finding talent that was able to kind of help you uh, do more things at it's once a, it's a bit of both of those things and a lot of networking as well I mean the the area yes. I was subcontracting early on is marketing well marketing is my background as well so I did have quite a lot of contacts that I could reach out to and say um, yeah. could you do this for me um, and so so that I was I was lucky that I could use my network and, and a lot of people have, a lot of founders are very resourceful people. They um, they do have good networks. And so a good place to start is with the people you know, because you know, you trust them, yeah. you know what they can deliver. So a network is a good place to start with. Um, after that, I did look a bit more widely um, broader and, and, and outside of my network. And yes, yeah, sites like Fiverr or LinkedIn become really good places to look for specific things if you know exactly what you mm. want. And and I'd ask around. I'd ask my uh, uh, colleagues and again in my network, people I, who ran their own businesses, who do you use for this? Who do you use for that? And I'd look for recommendations from others because that's another powerful way of finding the best people to help you with something. Yeah. You mentioned, obviously, you wanted to focus on the core of what you bring from an IP perspective, which is yeah. the delivery aspect. No one's going to do better than Hattie because this is what your passion well, the is. Delivery is your knowledge and the, base. the delivery and the content, I'd say, Kieran. So yeah. the delivery, I think, can be done by others. I don't think I'm the only person who can deliver um, yeah. what I do. But I think the content is is the gotcha. real essence of, of what I do. And it's about making yeah. it clear and easy for people to see a route a path through that process of raising investment and and that's what I've worked really hard to do make it a step-by-step -step process so that it's demystified it's easy to engage with um, and you you know you feel at ease with the process rather than at sea yeah uh, <laughs> indeed and as, as you mentioned, there, there's very much two sides to the business at any given time. There's the top of the funnel where you're generating new leads. And then there's the other bit where you're investing in the content piece, which is the, 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 the crucial bit that is driving people to come in at the top of the funnel, but also to succeed at the, the other end of the, the journey. So how do you manage from a time perspective to, to look up both sides do you split your diary out accordingly do you look at different tools that help you support both both aspects just kind of curious to see how you you manage those two very uh, varied pieces i think time is one of the biggest challenges all founders have there are or there is always more for you to do than there are hours in your day so i'm really rigorous with my time and i chop my diary up into segments and I, um, I prioritize certain things every week. For example, there is always sales and marketing activity in my diary every single week because otherwise the funnel dries up. And, and if the funnel dries up, you don't have leads. If you don't have leads coming through, you don't have new customers. If you don't have customers, you don't have revenue. So there is always every week time in my diary for sales and marketing activity. Obviously, there's always time in my diary for delivery. I love working yes. with my clients. So I always prioritize that. And, and that's where I get a lot of my new ideas as well, by talking to my customers and hearing what they're struggling with. So that's really important in my diary. And then the bits around the edge is where I shove in the things I don't really want to do, but I know I have to do. Yeah. So the admin, the accounting pieces, yes. the keeping on top of <laughs> emails yeah. <laughs> all of that stuff yeah. um but i tend to do those i put those into my diary in in the in the times of the day and the days of the week when i know i'm not at my best so it doesn't need yes. my best headspace it doesn't need my best yes. me um so i can do it at the end of the day if i'm a bit tired or i can do it on a friday when i'm really going to be focused on um, sorting out admin, preparing for the following yes. week's um, sessions or whatever it needs to be. So yeah, I really, I'm That's a strong it. believer in dividing your calendar up, your week up, your days up, and putting, scheduling what needs to happen based on its importance to your business. Gotcha. And just getting into those kind of little niggly annoying things like the admin or the cash flow management, the accounting side of things, how do you find that as a business owner? Is that a stressful part of the business or do you look to bring in external 
external resources like an accountant to assist with that? Like, how, how have you managed that aspect of, of the business? The At the moment, um, I haven't brought in an accountant, although I keep that as an option up my sleeve for later. My my, yeah. my business isn't terribly complex, um, so keeping on top of my accounting, yeah. so long as I do keep on top of it and do a bit every yes. week and uh, you know close down a month at the end of the month, so long as I keep on top of it, then I can manage that at the moment. I begrudge it slightly, so it's always on the list. Yeah. Is it now time to yeah. subcontract that out? <laughs> um, but, yeah. I, um, but it's not where I am at the moment. But it, um, yeah. The pain I, isn't that strong yet. The pain isn't that strong yet, so long as I keep on top of it. I think the real challenge comes when, uh, you know, if you're unwell or you take a holiday or your um, lovely structured week doesn't go to plan and you, you fall behind on some of those routine things then it can become a challenge to catch back up again. And do you use kind of a, a tool that at least helps you manage the account centrally um, in the place? Or are you, uh, yeah. So um, with open yeah. banking and all of that, all of the banks now have tools that plug into, whether it's Xero or QuickBooks or whatever. Um, so yeah. I'm plugged yeah. in with, the, with tools like that, for sure. And then I suppose, one thing we, we haven't kind of chatted into is more looking ahead and yes there's the aspect of uh, the delivery and the the top of the funnel but also i'd imagine there's a, a another piece which is developing constantly as a business as a founder how do you account for that and, and what are you looking to do to try and take focus for business onto the, the next stage of where you'd like to see it go yeah it's that's Actually, that's a really interesting um, bit. And, and in a way, um, that's the bit I would love to spend all my time on, the what next. And I think one of the challenges yeah. that I have as a founder is prioritizing the what next time rather than the delivery, the marketing, the admin type time that we've been talking about. Because yeah. it can be the thing that because it's about tomorrow rather than today, it can be put off. But it's actually the thing that fires me up the most which is really annoying, isn't it? If you can't spare the time yeah. to do the thing that fires you up the most. So I do, um, I try to do that on a monthly basis and I'm putting time out within a month, if not every week, to, to think about the what next. And one of the things um, that I'm working on right now has come out of a conversation with, um, initially with some of my customers and then with some of the stakeholders who have invested in their business. So the what next can come from surprising angles um, because although the conversation started with my customers, it's moved on to people who have invested in their businesses and they're talking to me about, could you do this? Could you do that? And that's quite fun because your, yeah. your mind starts going, oh, what about this? What about that? <laughs> and, oh, I wonder if, and, and that's the bit I love, the what next. But you'll have to watch the space uh, for that so, bit. <laughs> I'm not going to uh, give you a spoiler uh, here. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. So if I could just take your mind from the future for a second and throw it back to the past, because I, I, the way I'd like kind of be great to, to, to get your thoughts on, if I could pin you down to kind of one big challenge you found tough over since starting your own business and one big highlight that's made it kind of, this has been a great decision. What is there any kind of moment that would fit into either of those categories? Yeah, definitely. So uh, at the beginning of lockdown, um, you know, back at the beginning of last year, I was, I was, I was scared. No two ways about it. I was mm. thinking, crumbs. Mm. What does this mean for the world? The world is changing. What does it mean for the world? What does it mean for me? Um, what does it mean for my clients? And and I could see my clients in a similar position going, oh my gosh, we're really scared, right? We're closing down spending here. We're closing down spending there. We're retrenching, retrenching while we work out what comes next. And, you know, that's a challenging position for any business owner to be in. If, if they see their clients stopping spending and being nervous and uncertain. I remember sitting there thinking, how do I respond to this? Do I run for the hills scared and go and do something else entirely and give up? Or 
do I see this as an opportunity? And, and the biggest learning for me was um, when you stop the fear and you just stop and listen to what people around you were saying about their challenges and the support they need in that moment, my, my best product yet came out of that listening process. And it was tentative at first. I, I ran the first of the funding accelerators last July with a small cohort and it was like, oh, is this going to work? And I was really honest with people. This is experimental. We're trying it this way. But eight weeks later, when they came off the program, they were so excited about the process. Uh, A few weeks after that, when they started getting funding offers and and a, a few months after that, when their money was in the bank, it was like, okay, we have something here awesome. and it came from a place of fear and, and uncertainty yep. and now a year later it's a fully fledged product that um, is going from strength to strength so you know there are really tough Maybe. times in business um, for all of us everyone it goes through them and the, the real the real excitement I think is if you can ride through those and keep listening and keep open and keep responsive you can find the way through it and you can come out the other side with a really exciting product that people love. Amazing. Well, I can't think of a better way to finish it up with, with that. Um, thank you so much, Hattie, for sharing your experience with us and giving us an insight into Focus for Business. It's been absolutely brilliant having you on. So I just want to say thanks again for, for coming on and sharing your experience. It's my absolute pleasure. And to all those out there listening to this, wondering, should you do it? I would always say, go with your gut and be up for the journey. Keep listening to your customers and go for it and enjoy the journey because there isn't that, the journey is the is the business, it's part of the process. So enjoy that, those steps along the way. Don't keep thinking, when I sell this for a million pounds or whatever you, your, your aspiration might be, uh, you know, enjoy the journey because that's where the fun is brilliant wise wise words thanks so much holly thank you kieran